Welcome to the Metal Voice. Today on the show, Michael Gilbert, guitarist of Flotsam and Jetsam, and they've got a new album out. Let's talk about the new album, self-titled, Flotsam and Jetsam. Right away, I know a lot of people always ask you, this is probably the most common uh, question, what's up with the name? <laughs> is it the Flintstones and the Jetsons, or is it the Two Towers in uh, Lord of the Rings? <laughs> uh, well, they, actually, this, uh, the name of the band, this goes back to the Jason Newstead days. Uh, and he used to be heavy in uh, GR Tolkien and Lord of the Rings and all that sort of stuff, and that is where he got the name and the idea for it. And then upon further investigation, the, the meaning of it looked uh, kind of cool, like the vagrants of society and stuff like that. So uh, it just seemed pretty cool for a metal band, you know, back in the, the mid-'80s when all this stuff was evolving. Uh, Flossum and Jessam, vagrants of society, kind of scum back to the earth, you know. It's yeah. a great name for a metal band. Yeah, very cool. All right, so let's get into the new album. What did you guys do different on this album opposed to the last album, which was more, I don't know, uh, we'll call it 90s sounding. What we did differently is we really focused on the song uh, because the last, over the last two years, the, uh, you know, the feedback that we've got, we really want you guys to go back to old school thrash and, and what you guys have been doing. Uh, you know, we've been experimenting with a lot of stuff. We've been using some samples here and there. Uh, we've slowed some songs down. We've, we've gone into some different genres, I guess you could say. Yeah. Um, just explored a little bit, which it feels good to me, but what really feels like home to me is the thrash metal, the fast speed metal that we were doing on the first two records. And it, it's made all the sense of the world once we, uh, this lineup started, once we got together and started writing, uh, it, it made more sense to me to play that type of music. And it, it, it just feels more like home. I, uh, it's like, okay, this is, this is what we belong to. This is what we do. I, I got to say, though, I've, I've heard the album, and wow, I was pretty blown away. This is definitely, it's basically, it's exactly what you said. It's, and I'll say something more, it's the aggression, the thrash of, let's say, the early 80s and, let's say, Doomsday, that, that period, with the, I guess, technology today, right? To make it that much bigger and, uh, you know, brighter, or we'll call it thrashier, or, or more aggressive. And man, it's very melodic. It's, uh, I love the, the playing is, is ferocious. It's just a very, I, I gotta say, this is probably just as good as Doomsday. I mean, it's, 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 it's a great album. Uh, oh, what, wow, thanks a lot, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, what's, name me one of your, one or two of your favorite tracks and why. Yeah, man, that's tough. Uh, one of my favorite ones is Murder Tragedy, and I did, and uh, what I think about the record, what really shines for me on this record is AK. Yeah. Dude, jeez. Uh, he, he just keeps improving and improving. And he even did it on this one, you know. He's like, you know what? He's like, I've experimented on the last couple records. I've, I've gone into him. He still sounds like AK no matter what he does. But he actually put himself back in the mid-'80s, like when we first started. And he got that fire, and I don't know how he did it. Uh, recording his vocal tracks, I'm here. I'm sitting in the you know the room listening to him and engineering him, just going, "Holy crap, really, dude? You, you just did that? Wow!" Uh, Virgin Tragedy is uh, probably one of my favorites because at the end of it, he just he keeps bringing it up, bringing it up, bringing it up, and at the end, it just cuts you off and says, "You know, that's the end of the song, but at least you want more." You know, uh, he's, he's got that performance going on in it. Uh, it's giving me the chills when I was recording, so... Yeah, oh, yeah, the, the musicianship is excellent, by the way, also. But I got... Oh, you're, 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 you're bang on, man. Eric has brought the vocals to another level. And I think that's what separates Plotsam to other thrash bands, where it's sort of like the singer is just there as a sort of, like, filler, you know? Uh, Eric actually, you know, he just... I mean, that's what the 80s was all about. I mean, a lot of 80s was about that, too, not only in thrash, but good vocal melodies, good vocal lines, and good singing. And actually, I think he's singing a lot better now than he did back then, because back then you could see he was young, he's trying to learn his craft. Now he's, he's, he's more mature, and he's got a deeper tone to his voice. I don't know if you agree to that or not. He's truly a one-of-a-kind, very unique. Uh, he's got his own style, for sure. 
write the song Iron Maiden. Okay, uh, Iron Maiden. <laughs> People are gonna say, okay, they, they 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 wrote this song just you know to get a little, I guess you know to get a little attention, right? I mean, okay, what's whose idea was that? Iron Maiden. It sounds like the melody sounds like the Trooper. You know, it's an homage or a tribute to Maiden. Who whose idea was this? You know, it was never uh, like a conceived idea where. Hey, we're, let's do a song that makes it kind of sound like an Iron Maiden song, or kind of along that realm in that genre. It was never designed for that at all. And this one uh, was one of Steve's ideas. That's how it spawned. And uh, by the time it got done, and AK put that that vocal melody on it, it was like, oh wow, okay, this this is pretty cool. Yeah. So what we did is when we signed with our new record label, which is AFM, we you know. They're full on into it, so they suggested, you know, we totally took their suggestions on what the single should be, the first three, you know, and Iron Maiden was the one that they were like, this is the one that's got to go out first, and they were dead on on that because we've got a lot of really, really great reviews. I haven't seen one bad review on it yet, which I'm stoked because we we, get, we got hammered pretty good on the Ugly Noise TV, you know, for changing the, the thrash styles and <laughs> I agree with you, man. At first, I thought it was actually the song Iron Maiden by Iron Maiden. And then when I heard it, I go, wait a second. And actually, it's good. It, work, it works in your favor because at the end of the day, it's a great song, right? That's what, that, that's what it's all about. That is, you're, that's exactly right. That's what it's all about. Yeah. It's about the song. So let's go back in time now, okay? A lot of people want to know about the history too, right? And then we'll go back into the present. All right, so Doomsday for the Deceiver comes out. I mean, what's the... I mean, this is critically acclaimed. This is, this is, everybody knows the band for this album, right? This is mm -hmm. like, you guys have played the whole album in its entirety, right, on tour. Um, w w what was the feeling like when Jason, I, I don't even know what Jason used to do, what, at what point did he say, okay, guys, I'm leaving the band after you've written this great album? And, and what was the mood like when he said he was leaving? Were you guys mad, upset, hurt? No, uh, uh it, it's like anything else, you know, it's a great opportunity for him. Uh, I'm still great friends with Newstead. I talk to him uh, once or twice a month, of, you know, we, we still communicate. And uh, I was, nobody was ever really mad at him for it. I mean, uh, that was just a decision he wanted to make. We kind of knew what was happening once Cliff died. Like, I mean, we, we all were like, Newstead is the guy for this. So we kind of expected it. And, uh, yeah, he was definitely the right guy to, to fill Cliff's shoes. Uh, I mean, uh, really nobody can, but, you know, Jason is Jason, and he brought that to Metallica. You know, he brought uh, his personality to that band, and he's always been over-the-top personality, uh, just a, uh, an awesome character to hang out with. You know, he's very funny. He's larger than life when you hang out with him. Justice for All comes out. I mean, there's no bass on it. Did he ever call you up and say, guys, guys, I don't know. I don't know if I, you know, they've lowered all my bass parts on this album. Did he ever complain to you guys about this? I mean. And he left this band. He was full into the, he was deep into the band, you know. I mean, he was a full member. And there would be no other band that he would leave to go join of the, uh, you know, Metallica. So when Injustice came out, well, Garage Shade came out before that, and yeah. you could hear the bass on that. It sounded killer, you know, it was awesome. But when Injustice came out, there was no bass. I mean, there almost had to be, and I'm not speaking because he's told me this or anything like that, but for me, it would have been a pride thing, like, oh, oh shit, you know, what the hell did I just do? You know, I'm still in this band, but I'm not hurt, I don't have a voice. Yeah. And when I say you don't have a voice, I mean his, his bass, didn't translate in the mix, which is awful because that guy is a tremendous bass player. Okay, so Jason's out of the band. He's having a success with Metallica. The band carries on, right? No place for disgrace. You know, when the storm comes down, um, I, you guys are getting some movement. You know, you got a lot of attention because Jason used to be in the band. And plus, you guys are writing some great tunes, right? Don't get me wrong. At what point did you yourself say, you know, then I guess the, the 90s hit and the grunge era hit, and what point did you say, oh, maybe this is not for me? I mean, what happened? Uh, yeah, there was a point where I didn't exist the band for a while. Yeah. It was due to some of the managerial and the business part of it. I was like, we, the five of us, don't have this, we're not running this thing anymore. It's 
not our deal. We've got all these other irons in the fire, and it's a bunch of shit, and it's time for me to move on. And, uh, yeah, I want to be clear on that because, you know, if you're a band and you don't have any say in what you're doing and what you're making and creating, then you're not a band, you know? Sure. All right, man. Uh, so listen, tell me, what, what's a tour looking like? When's the tour starting? Uh, where are you guys planning on going? Well, we're trying to put something together for the United States uh, in June. And that's still in the making. We don't have an announcement for that yet. But we just announced today uh, that we're going to be going out with Destruction over oh. in Europe in, uh, in October. There you go, folks. Uh, Flots of Jets himself titled album to be released when? May? What's the date? May? What do we got there, Michael? May 20th is when it'll be officially released into the public. On AFM Records. A must. I mean, this is like a, a, a return. A return more aggressive. Great mel melodic vocal lines, thrashing, uh, great musicianship. Uh, Michael, thank you for being a guest on the show. Everyone, please go check out the band live. They'll be coming. They'll be touring in Europe and the United States, and hopefully in Canada. Any final words there, Michael? Oh, I just gotta say thank you, Jimmy, for having me on your show. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you, and uh, it's it's my pleasure, man.